Marita, have you? Oh, there's the recording going. I was just wondering, where's the recording going? So my name is Anna-Marie Lombard. I'm the founder and CEO of Century Intelligence Consulting. And then with me is Marita de Toy. She is my left hand and my right hand and a co-facilitator and also one of our coaches. So we work together like a charm. And we are just going to take you through our practitioner's course. So I'm going to share screen with you guys and take you through slides. It's just an easier way. It makes it a little bit more interesting that you don't just need to listen to my voice. You've got some images as well, which is good multi-century learning for us. Um, and then you can also follow the slides uh, throughout. Um, we've put together a nice introduction to the work that we do. I'm gonna share what Century Intelligence is really all about. And then Marita towards the end will share more about the course with you. Uh, there will be some time for questions. We'll just see how much time allows. Okay, so this is the introduction to our Rolls-Royce course. And I always use the Rolls-Royce words because it truly, truly is uh, a course that I've started in 2012. So it's been around for a long time. Thank you to COVID. We are a COVID success story. When COVID came, we had to really uh, re-look, rethink, redo, and we pivoted and then put this course into an online platform which has been phenomenal. I always used to say, we are never going to do online training because it doesn't fit into our brand. Well, needless to say, I'm eating my own words. We have taken this course to online. It's really getting professional people out there that want to use material into their current practices or coaching and just take it to the next level. So it's a really well-designed course. It's been running for a long time. It truly is the Rolls Royce version of all of our products. So from that point of view, we really, really chuff to share it with you. Okay, so I'm just going to do three things. Uh, you know, the brain really remembers things in three. I will provide you with introduction and overview uh, what essential intelligence really all about. Some of you might know it, some of you might not. Uh, those of you who know it already, don't worry. The, the brain really learns well through repetition. So hearing things a second, a third, and a fourth times make you really remember it better. Those of you who haven't been introduced to our work before, it will be a great way for you to understand a little bit more about the stuff that we are doing. Secondly, I'll share a little bit about century assessments with you. And then thirdly, century strategies, which is really, I think, where our work becomes exceptionally tangible, practical, and easy to follow and easy to implement. Okay, so let's shoot and run off with that. I'm going to give you a little bit of context, which is pretty scary if we want to look at it from this point of view. I'm going to go a little bit back into global mental health data. It is a little bit older stats referring to 2017, but I'll revisit it with updated stats as well. 792 million people suffer from mental health disorders worldwide. And as I say, this is all the stats. And according to the World Health Organization, that's what uh, WHO stand for, one in four people suffer from a mental health disorder. 800,000 people die from suicide every year. That's literally one death every four seconds, which is truly, truly scary. And suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 29 year olds. And although this is all the stats, we do know that teenage suicide has been increasing significantly. 264 million people suffer from depression. As I say, this is 2017 stats. So how has this picture changed due to COVID? Look, and I know all of us are kind of sick and tired. We don't want to talk COVID. We don't want to think COVID. But it is a bit of that elephant in the room which can't be ignored uh, because I, I think what COVID has done, it has really put an emphasis on mental health globally, which I think is good. Mental health has always been an important factor, but has been certainly disregarded throughout various industries, various decision makers. And I do think it's really important that we start to look at mental health for what it really is. And it is obviously really, really important. So how has this picture changed since COVID? Thanks for everyone who's joining us, guys. We're really happy that you are here. We're going to run through the material. There will be a recording afterwards made available. So just collate your questions as we go throughout the, the, the content. We will have time towards the end to share this. So just a little bit of what's out there from a stats point of view. <clears throat> 
Uh, the share of adults who experienced stress, anxiety, or sadness that was difficult to cope with alone during the pandemic. Now, any one of you wants to look at stats, go check Statista. I don't, I don't have a paid membership, but it's a really great tool if you want to be on top of what's happening from a statistical point of view. You do have access to quite a large data set. So this was done February to June 2020. I know this puts us right in the middle of COVID and a sample of 8,259 people. And we can see that already in the midst of the pandemic, there was a huge increase in how people were really experiencing an increase in stress, sadness, or anxiety, okay? And <clears throat> yes, we are kind of post-pandemic. Will we ever be post-pandemic? I don't know. Time will tell. But I think these figures do show the steamroller impact that COVID had had on mental health as a whole. And then actually the right side of the slide for me is pretty, pretty scary. Um, the increase in... Um, pharmaceutical use or medications following COVID, 34.1% more people are using anti-anxiety medication. And this was a huge sample, 31.5 million commercially insured individuals. Okay, it was a, a figure from the US, so it is US-based stats, but I do think it really does indicate the picture. 18.6% more people were using antidepressants, and 14.8% more people were using medication to help them to fall asleep. Quite scary. Uh, I'm going to say something controversial, and I know this is recorded, and I don't mind this being recorded. I'm sure the pharmaceutical companies is pretty happy about that, but this is not a good sign for mental health globally, for mental health wherever you are in the world, but certainly globally. That's not the kind of stuff that we want to see happening. <clears throat> and then just a little bit, you know, I think what we are seeing these first two little hills on the left of this figure is the impact of COVID. But this big blue one is, I think, where we are sitting and we're riding into the post-COVID mental health pandemic, the second one, really. It's literally riding off from what's been happening in COVID. Um, and we do know the world is in a mental health crisis for sure. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, remember, stands for World Health Organization, there is a 25% increase in global anxiety and depression. 25% <clears throat> is huge. Okay, so that's really, really quite a scary stats to look at. And then according to Lancet, uh, the current cost of mental health globally is 2.5 trillion US dollars globally currently. 2.5 trillion dollars and it's expected to rise to 6 trillion in 2030. I know I'm sorry I got it wrong on the LinkedIn ad. I, 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 I'm not a good detail person. <clears throat> I've got high century thresholds. Marita does the detail and I just do the quick and fast stuff. So I quoted 30 trillion. So guys, no, it's only 6 trillion, but that's still a hell of a lot of money. So that is what mental health is probably going to account to costing globally the world economy in US dollars. Um, this does mean that there is a lot of work to be done. And <clears throat> I'm assuming, and we've tried to invite people who work in this particular industry, in this arena, what we can do as healthcare providers, as coaches, as psychologists, as wellness practitioners, as HR managers, how are we going to support the people that we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think that's the big question where we want to look at. So that's a little bit of the scary stats that I do think if we look at that stats, um, you know, we need to have some solutions and we certainly need to have some answers in this whole process. So which brings me to Century Intelligence. What are we all about? How does it work? What is the framework? So Marita and I are both occupational therapists. So we are absolutely rooted and all of our work is embedded in the healthcare profession. Okay. So if we go back, Century Intelligence goes back to the 60s to Jean Ayers. She was an occupational therapist in... Uh, California in the United States, she started the whole concept of sensory integration. Now, sensory integration is very well known in the occupational therapy world, often extensively used in the autism population. But I must say, it is a little bit of yesterday. It is our roots. 
and I'm profoundly indebted to GNS for starting or having started this work, but a lot of water has, has actually gone into the sea following ESA's work in the 60s. So essentially processing is the more updated, the newer term, uh, it's also a more universal term. So if you ever want to read up on this, go uh, type in century processing and try to go Google Scholar and just not Google. We all know that Google is our best friend, but can also be quite an enemy. Uh, but century processing have been studied extensively in our particular area of, of, of um, industry in occupational therapy, but also studied in psychology quite extensively through the work of Elaine Aaron, Marvin Zuckerman, and it also have been studied in the world of food. Uh, you know, how do we actually label food or design food? So there's a big century element to that. And even in neuroleadership and commercial psychology and environmental psychology. So it's a much better concept than just where our roots are from. But all the work that we do are fully, fully based on neuroscience. It's based on the sensory receptors, every single sensory system has a receptor, and then it obviously has a particular pathway where it reach or work through the peripheral areas of the body to reach the central nervous system. So fully, fully neuroscientifically based. I'll elaborate a little bit later, but um, absolutely neuroscientifically based. We also know neuroscience has really I think stepped up has, uh, we've seen lots of development in that particular arena. So just so that you're very aware of everything that we do is have got this very strong neuro, uh, neuroscience base. The one thing that's quite sad for me, it has a huge application in the world of mental health, which is not being identified and certainly not recognized. This is why we are so passionate about using sensory intelligence as a mental health solution. Uh, which is really what we want to share with you through the session for today. So the mental health tool, so what we do as a mental health tool, and we had a discussion with one of our users this morning who's using our work predominantly for anxiety management. <clears throat> as we go through the material, you'll possibly be able to connect those dots, but we can use it. And I believe we, we prefer to use it just from our context point of view is as a health promotion tool. We don't want people to get ill. We want people to find easy, accessible, effective strategies to actually improve their current mental health or keep on maintaining a good current mental health state that they don't fall off the wagon and actually be diagnosed. Uh, so our approach from Century Intelligence from a brand point of view is very much around health promotion, but we have a lot of users, people who do our practitioners course and use our tools that apply it in mental health diagnosis. And it usually is around managing the diagnosis, managing the system. <clears throat> Our work in particular is not going to highlight or identify or diagnose a mental health issue. No, it's a supportive process where we can enable, enable the person who does our assessments and go through our work to manage their day-to-day -day lives easier, uh, faster, more effectively so that we can help them managing their mental health. The other thing, a lot of the work that we do is also around productivity. Yes, mental health is a big focus. Um, but we all know now we've shifted into remote working, home working, hybrid working. Where the hell are we working? So that's another big question that is being asked. And the work that we do really can help you. Should you work at home? Should you work at the office? Or could you do hybrid? And after you've made these correct choices, um, how can you adapt your environment so that it's more conducive? Um, so just a little bit, the other element where the work that we do, where the work that we do can add a lot of value. Okay, so then a little bit more, sensory intelligence is about the seven senses. Yes, we have seven, not just five. Um, and then they influence our attention, our emotion and our behavior. So these three core functions, I sometimes feel when we do our practitioners work, those are the three words that I mention the most attention, emotion, and behavior. There are three core human functions that we all need every day in order to just stay sane, do your work, care for yourself, care for your family, be part of your community. Whatever we do, three baseline human behavior functions, attention, emotion, and behavior. 
So really important to look at that. So what we do as assessments, we do a lot of century-based assessments. And then we are really, really big on empowering people to use this information to apply strategies, to make adaptations, to, you know, a, a silly example. I can't tell you how many people over the years I've said, for heaven's sake, don't go to the gym. The gym is not your space to go to. And I've had many people in the past, oh, I should go to the gym. I should go to the gym more. If we understand your sensory thresholds and what you are sensitive for and what your brain needs, the gym might be the last place on earth for you to go to. It's busy. It's smelly. The gym do smell. I've got high thresholds, so I don't know. My son, who's now 21, uh, we're quite a big active gym family. We once walked to the gym and he said, mom, you know, the gym smells. It stinks, actually. And I had to chuckle and I laughed and I looked at him and I said, yes, I know, but obviously it doesn't smell for me. And as the doors opened, he said, mom, mom, can you smell that? It truly stinks. So just one of the really simple stuff that we can help you to understand if you are smell sensitive, you know, don't go to the gym. Then maybe a smaller gym off peak, but a busy gym of lots of people is really smelly for people who's got what we call low thresholds or sensitivity for the sense of smell. Uh, so it's really around understanding yourself and what strategies should you be deploying. And it's user-friendly and simplified theory made very, very practical. Uh, I will say that the sensory processing theory and methodology is exceptionally complex. It's very multifaceted. It's based around a myriad of sensory pathways and sensory structures and neuroscience structures. And it's always been seen as a very difficult concept to understand. And when I started to do the, this work in the early 2000s, I made it my mission. This is so powerful. We need to help people to understand it, that it's user-friendly, and then that it is accessible to anyone, which is really what we want to do. So it's holistic, practical, so that we can help you to improve your mental health and well-being, improve your productivity, and improve your relationships. The relationship key to sensory intelligence is fascinating. Uh, one person is noise seeking, turn up the TV at home. I want it louder. Partner might be noise sensitive and say, for heaven's sake, the TV is too loud. Please turn it down. So the stories that we can keep you busy with on how different threshold patterns has influenced relationships and it has caused divorce and breakups in many, many people that we've worked with in the past. And if you understand how we are all different, we are all wired differently. The world smells, looks, tastes, feels different for all of us. And that makes us do things a particular way. And if we can understand that about ourselves and other people, it really makes us a lot more compassionate and a lot more understanding. So a lot to do with relationships. So I, I thought just to share this with you, I don't want to go too much into research, but I believe Maybe for a lot of you who's not, aware, uh, who's not really aware of our work, I just want to take you back into the research space. I've done my PhD. I'm currently busy writing research articles, so heaven knows why. A lot of the time, I'm literally steeped into data and steeped into research. It is a fascinating world to operate in, but I thought to share this with you. There's significant, significant links between sensory processing and mental health disorders. Now, did my thing just go away, Marita? Is my, oh my goodness me, I haven't signed out. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Let me sign in. I don't know why Google decided I need to get signed out now. Heaven knows for Google. Sorry, guys. This is interesting. And Marie, luckily with your high thresholds, you can just roll with us where I would I have been thrown it. completely. So... <laughs> You know what, as I say, technology, we love it, we hate it, but that's exactly the case. I've got high thresholds, so whatever the, the screen throws at me, let's just throw with the punches. Marita would have had five heart attacks by now. So Marita, that's why you're such a great support person. Where was I? Don't know why that happened. Okay, so just the research, I want to put that into perspective for you. There's more than enough. At a, there's actually, if you go check our website, and I'm jumping the gun, we've got a whole button around research because I'm very passionate about research. It does provide evidence base and credibility to the work that we are doing. Please go feel free to browse through our research page on our website. But we've seen significantly 
sensory processing has a significant link with depression. We've seen that in study after study after study with anxiety, with affect. In other words, people having a more positive affect versus a more negative affect. Pain. People who experience pain and pain faster also have been shown to have a very particular sensory processing style. Vitality, job stress and burnout, relationship, ASD, the autism spectrum disorder group, highly, highly, highly struggle from sensory processing issues. It's a very, very well-known phenomena to an extent that on the DSM-5, uh, which is the manual for diagnosis, it's a worldwide use system. Uh, sensory processing is one of the subsets when you have to diagnose for autism spectrum disorder. And we also know a very wide group of people suffering from ADHD also have sensory based problems. So very, very clear. And I just thought these two articles, uh, Harrison 2019, that was a review article and Baylord and Wiggum that was also a scoping review article. Both of those, I mean, when you see a review article, when you do a research, it's like, yay, because they've done all the work for you. You can just read through their reviews. But these are review articles combining hundreds of studies put together to confirm sensory processing does have a link with mental health diagnosis. And if we know there is this link, it can become a predictor. Also, with the sensory matrix assessment that we do, we can predict what is your stress risk based on your thresholds. And we'll obviously talk about that as we go through it. So it's all in the brain. Let me just give you our most favorite, beloved brain picture. As I said, all the work that we do is brain-based. And obviously, this wonderful, colorful piece of equipment here is the cortex, uh, the central nervous system. We all have access to that. That is what we use on a day-to-day -day basis to just function and get done what needs to get done. So the senses impact the way that we work, we learn, and we live. And what is important to show here is these are your seven senses, and I'll talk you through them right now. Visual, auditory, touch, smell, taste, and then we've got two movement senses. But they enter the brain through the spinal cord and through the primitive brain structures. So that little circle there is like a magical circle because it deeps, it goes deep down into the lower structures of the brain. So in order to get to the cortex, because the thinking and the work that we do is cortical, it's based on the upper part of the brain, and in particular, the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is where we do those amazing problem solving, abstract thinking, all those wonderful stuff that makes us very, very clever. But in order to reach this part of the brain, we process stimulation from the environment. And all of this stimulation first needs to go through the primitive brain structures before it gets used for the top part of the brain. That's the hierarchy in the brain. This is how the pathways work. None of these pathways has a direct connection into the cortex. It doesn't work like that. And if I ask you the question, can you remember the last time when you said something, done something to realize a split second later, oh, wrong, I shouldn't have done that. That's where this hierarchy of the brain came and it bit you in the butt. Because things happen, the brain perceives or take that input and then there's an immediate response because the primitive brain, the lower part of the brain doesn't have capacity for thinking. It's been designed to be intuitive, to be instinctive and to work fast. Brilliant, because if you are chased by a lion, you can't think, mm, what does this look like? You gotta just get out there and run. So the primitive brain is our protective brain, our more uh, reflexive brain, but it does process all of the sensory information before it gets to the top. So this hierarchy is really, really important. Like if you need to get to the top of a high rise building, you need to press the, the, the button of the lift at the, at the bottom, step in there, which will take you to the top of the high rise building. The brain works in exactly the same way. I hope none of you are major neuroscience gurus, because then you will possibly say, Anna Marie, you are lying. The brain is extremely complex, extremely complex. So there's constant interaction between these brain parts, but it is the initial intake of sensory information through to the brain, which is really, really important. So what are the seven senses? Let's just talk about them. Seeing and hearing your eyes and your ears. 
This is the senses that work the hardest, take the most amount of information in. Absolutely. We learn, we act, we do, we think through them. And in red, I've written, they are overloaded. Um, we are living in an information overload society or an information overload era. And we are constantly being bombarded through visual and auditory information. So our eyes and our ears work exceptionally hard. And for those of you who have migrated to a home working environment, we all know your office now is as big as your computer screen. Okay. So we sit and we stare, stare, work in this 4.4 rectangular screen on a day to day basis. So there's not enough variation in the sensory systems anymore. So it's really significantly even been confounded further because of the fact that our worlds have shrunk in our mobility because of COVID. Then if we look at touch, smell, and taste, now touch, smell, and taste is kind of our social senses. Touch is in your skin. Everything in your skin will give you touch information. You've got skin from the top of your head right down to the soles of your feet. Your skin also tells you where does your body ends and the world begins. Your skin also gives you that sense of comfort in where are you in space? How comfortable are you with people close to you? Or how, or how much do you need people to be outside of your space? And heaven forbid if anyone touches you from behind, which is typically something that we see with people who are more touch sensitive. But the touch system, very, very important. Also the clothing that you wear. Can you feel the label at the back of your shirt? Does your seam in your sock bother you? Are you fussy with clothing? Those are all how your touch threshold predict your certain level of comfort or behaviors and how you engage with self-care or even something like clothing. Smell and taste. Smell and taste are the two chemical senses. They work together. Smell is the preferential sense of the brain. It is the one sensory pathway that bypass what we call the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is grand central station in the brain. Smell bypasses that, goes di directly to the limbic system, emotion and memory. The limbic system facilitate emotion and memory. That's why when there's a smell, oh, that smells like my, my grandmother's kitchen, or it elicits either a memory or an emotion quite strongly when we smell something because of the pathway. The bugger about smell is then because we know the sensory pathways connect in the brain at various levels. If people have phoned me over the years and said, oh, Anna Marie, I'm very sensitive to smell. Can you help me? I'm like, oh, no, I can't because we can't get in the pathway because we use other sensory pathways to override what's happening in the nervous system of one particular pathway. That's how we do self-regulation through sensory systems but we can't do it for smell because we can't get into that pathway there's not a connection and then obviously taste around food and how we experience food also deprived uh, in the way that we're living now we know socially we've had to restrict what we do where we go um, and I don't want to get wrapped up in that discussion but I'm quite worried how this is going to impact us going, you know, looking down the line or further down the line, because we are social beings. We depend on social connection for relationships, for nurturing. Um, and we definitely have seen a big, I think, shift in how much touch input we can get and how much social engagement we can get. And then I don't want to even start with our toddlers and babies from their development point of view. Needless to say, these three senses have been deprived. I think a little bit taste might be a little bit different. I think we are now too close to the kitchen. Those of you who work from home and it's so easy to go and to grab something out of your kitchen. So I think we might be overeating because of COVID. Now you're working in your home. Um, so that might be a little bit, but then you, you know, but it's important to look at these three senses hang together from a social point of view. And then the other two senses that most people are not very much aware of, which I really, really, really want to spend time on. We've got two movement senses and they work through two different pathways and two different set of receptors. One is the vestibular system. The vestibular system is in your inner ear and you basically have five organs in your inner ear that lies right next to your cochlea that gives you feedback on your gravity, 
your positioning space, your balance, and whenever there's any head movement, your vestibular system is a little bit like your body's GPS, okay? So very, very important. The fact for you that you are able to sit up straight on your chair without falling over is a product of your vestibular system and how well it connects with proprioception. Sorry, proprioception is in your muscles and in your joints. Every time when you move a muscle and when you move a joint, you are utilizing the proprioceptors, which is another way to help your body stay aware of where you are in space. The ability for you to walk downstairs without holding onto the rail is a product of your proprioceptors working together with your vestibular system. These two sensors working together are our regulation sensors. They help us to de-stress. They help us to get the brain calm, to get the brain focused, to get the brain organized. So they are our regulation sensors. Think about it. If you've sat down and you've worked on a big document or a big proposal and you feel very, very tired, what do you do? You would get up, okay? Now, it's not after that coffee or that tea or that glass of water that you are after. And by the way, glass of water is much better than coffee or tea, health 101. Um, it's because your brain is telling you you need to get up because you can't stay focused anymore. So that's why stretching between all your activities and having a timer that comes up, it's time for a stretch, is so critical because every time when you move your body, you tap into these particular pathways, which kind of self-corrects what we call your arousal level in the brain. Your arousal level in the brain is what supports attention and concentration. And we know we all have been deprived from a movement point of view since COVID happened. Just think about it. When we were in a traditional office, you would work in one space, then you walk to the bathroom, or you would go to a meeting room, or you would go somewhere else, or you would drive somewhere, or you would even fly somewhere. Okay, I am making this assumption, so it might not be true for all of you. But as I say, our worlds have shrunk. We're not moving as much as we used to anymore on a day-to-day -day basis. So the whole self-regulation pattern, the pattern of using different senses in the brain throughout the day has become fairly flat and stunted. It's all visual, auditory, visual, auditory, visual, auditory. Oh, I'm tired, maybe I should go for a move now. What's interesting, what I did yesterday, guys, I'm a runner, a lazy runner. I'm very lazy, but I love to run. I have never been as fit as I'm now because yesterday I went to the gym at one o'clock because I was doing research and my brain was fried. And at the end of my day, I got onto my running gear and I also went for a run just because I'm mindfully using more uh, movement activities because I know I'm too stationary. I'm sitting and sitting and sitting. Sometimes it's feel my butt is going to actually grow I don't know, roots into my chair. So we are sitting a lot and our bodies need to move. This is important for every single adult on this call, but shoo, guys, it's important for our kids as well. Um, Marita and I, our previous lives was working with children. This is where a lot of our experience and clinical work comes from. And how do we help a, a, a younger brain to mature and to mature properly? But the same thing apply into adults. It's been the most fascinating thing for me starting to work with adults. We are actually just children and bigger bodies. The brain still works the same way. Um, so very, very important. So hopefully that has given you some input in the seven senses. And then to just take it a little bit further, the brain can be cut in half. So imagine now these seven senses come in and they come in at the bottom. We've got the conscious controlled calculated brain at the top and then we've got the unconscious intuitive and more intuitive uncontrolled part the brain at the bottom now the top part of your brain you reason you think you learn and you perform with the lower part of the bottom how it the lower part the bottom of the brain gut habits preferences comfort levels okay now it's really really interesting if we look at the science out there, and this is based on a lot of research, those of you who are interested in neuroscience, go check, uh, go read the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, they got a Nobel uh, Prize for the research work that's really listed in that particular book. So the thinking brain allocated about 20% of brain activity to the cortex, where the feeling primitive brain allocate about 80% of activity to this more fundamental, unconscious, uncontrolled part of the brain. So it is quite an energy split 
And for those of you who think, mm, you wonder if this is true, I'll prove it to you very soon. Uh, but just remember, or to take that into consideration, that leads us to, uh, and then attention, emotion, and behavior is facilitated through this lower brain process. So then sensory intelligence, everything that we do is around the primitive brain. What happens in the primitive brain? How does the sensory stimulation from the environment comes into the lower part of the brain so that the brain can sense first, then the brain feels, and then the brain thinks. This is the hierarchy. And sensory intelligence is the sense part of the brain. EQ, emotional intelligence, is the feeling part of the brain, the emotional part. And then IQ is the thinking part of the brain. So if we look at it from this point of view, very, very important. And we know traditionally EQ, uh, we love EQ. We support it 100%. We think it's such a phenomenal concept is limbic system based, midbrain based. And a lot of your traditional personality testing that we look at or your IQ, your IQ test, we know only looked at the cortex. So thank heavens that's not being utilized as much today anymore. But typically your personality profiling tools like your insights or uh, your strengths finder or your disk profile, your enneagrams, uh, your big five. These are a lot of these tools up there and they all are phenomenal. They mostly look at midbrain to top brain. We literally look at this lower primitive part of the brain very much, not quite in isolation because we can never isolate the brain, but this is our focus. What is happening with the senses? How do they enter the brain and how do they facilitate automatic responses without us even being aware of it, which is the important thing. So stress, yes, we can think about stress in the higher parts of the brain, but stress is also a lower brain function, really, really important to look at it. And it is often environmentally driven. That's why we often talk about sensory overload, because sensory overload is how actually does the brain perceive all of the stimulation and how do we filter that? And we all filter very uniquely and differently uh, from one another. Okay, so this is how I wanted to prove this to you, but I am mindful of time. So I'm going to be very sneaky now. I'm going to give you the question. I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to help you see if you can find the answer. And that's not going to explain the answer. Then I want you to go back to the recording and to check what the answer is, just because I'm mindful of time and I want to see if there would be any questions. A bat in a ball costs one rand ten. I'm just going to use South African currency. It's easier for me to talk through but it could be pounds or dollars or euros. The bat costs one rand more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Total credit to Daniel Kahneman. So what would you say? A bat and a ball cost one rand 10. The bat costs one rand more than the ball. Um, how much does the ball cost? The intuitive answer would be 10 cents, 10 cents. And 10 cents is the wrong answer. So I'm going to skip now because I'm not gonna give you the answer. Please go back and then go figure out what it is. Okay. But it's all about the environment. I'm going to use this as an example. Who wants to be a millionaire? If those people, those contestants sit there, they are exposed to sensory overload, lights, people, music, lots going on. And then they usually say, oh, I can't get the answers. It, when I'm at home, I usually know all the answers. What has changed? The environment has changed. So the producers of the show, and it's a little bit of old dated, and often I think I give my age away when I quote this, um, they put the contestant in an uncomfortable sensory position. So they allocate that 80% activity into the primitive brain. Only when the information reached the cortex, which is only that 20%, do we have capacity to answer those questions? So just bear that in mind. Singapore Airlines, guys, is a perfect example. Well, happily, it's not Com A or BA. You know, they just have a big problem. So Singapore Airlines, I'm assuming Singapore Airlines is still flying. They are one of the best known cases of sensory branding. They went to the laboratory and they trademark and design a smell, which is the Singapore Airlines smell. So con um, the retail industry and consumer industry use the senses to kind of influence us very primitively to buy certain products. So we make buying decisions based on the sensory appeal of certain products. This is a whole industry on its own called sensory branding. So I always say, if 
a consumer can get us to buy their products using the senses. How much influence do we have if we understand our own senses and how we can influence the quality of our lives going forward? So we don't want to be manipulated into buying. We want to actually willfully and with the right information, insight and empowerment, use these skills that we all have very uniquely to better the days that we go through. And then Mercedes employed seven engineers to design the sound of these cars and their door closing, the sound of the door closing, because kadoof versus kadwa is going to make you two different buying decisions. So, uh, and I want to do a vlog, Marita, around my car is sensory. Um, it's just amazing how I bought a new car, guys, uh, two years ago, and there's a lot of sensory stuff in my car. If I put it in reverse, the radio goes softer. And we all know the seatbelt, beep, 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 that sound, okay? So cars use sensory elements so that the brain can be more focused. Isn't that amazing? So it is used very predominantly in the world of retail. What we want to empower you with is let's bring it into the world of mental health, human development and human behavior. Uh, just a bit of the neuroscience. Remember, I've talked about that. There are two areas autonomic nervous system, reticular activating system, which we focus on you know, extensively. Through the uh, reticular activating system, we can influence arousal, attention. Um, you know, if you feel warm and snuggly, you're gonna start to feel asleep. If you are cold, temperature, your brain is gonna feel more awake. Many, many examples to that, just one quick one. And then the autonomic nervous system is your fight, flight, and fright response all the sensory pathways connect with it. So you can actually have an autonomic nervous system response, fight, flight, or fright, when someone touches you from behind and you are so, uh, touch sensitive, as an example. Uh, so really important to look at that. A little bit around sensory assessments. Um, I've actually spent a lot of my career designing, developing, researching these tools. One is the sensory quiz, it's for free, online uh, on our website. It's just a bit of a teaser, guys, just to play around with it. Uh, then we've got the Sensory Matrix, which has, I've spent many, many years in developing and designing. That is our wellness tool. It's 120 questions and we can really tell what are your separate thresholds. In other words, your level of sensitivity for each of your senses and then help you to actually guide uh, or help you or, or suggest strategies accordingly to that. For instance, you get a 26 page report if you've done your sensory metrics online, it's all online. If you are noise sensitive, we would say, turn down your, uh, your noise notification on your phone, make sure you use headphones, don't go work in a, in a noisy coffee shop. So what we do, we give you very practical strategies to align with your threshold for that system so that you make better choices, so that you, rem you keep your brain calm, focused, without going into overload and stress, okay. Then just, I wanna briefly mention Senses at Work is a new tool that we're about to launch at the end of this month, which is going to use the Sentry questionnaire or the Sentry-based theory and methodology to help you should you work at home, should you work in the office, or should you do hybrid? And then also how you can adapt your work environment, okay. Then we do use the concept of a sensory tree. Are you a seeker, which is the leaves of a tree? Are you a trunk, a sensory neutral, or a sensory avoider, which is the roots? The sensory tree terminology has really been, uh, it's very well accepted. It's often referred to, I was contacted by someone in London four years after I've done a local workshop. I want that workshop of the tree. So the tree really sticks with people. It's such a fun, non-threatening, easy way are you a root, are you a trunk, or are you a leaf? Roots, low thresholds, more intuitive, but also more overloaded by their environments. Um, deep down on the ground, cool, calm, quiet, they anchor the tree. The leaves on the other end, sun, wind, butterflies, bees, high threshold, need more stimulation, need more output. And then thank goodness, we've got the sensory trunks, the neutrals in the middle, who either or. And this, um, 
this whole continuum of scores and results, this is where the relationship component becomes exceptionally useful because the roots and the, and the leaves do irritate each other, but they also support each other also really, really well. That's just a little bit my research. 36% of the population, my research population, had high thresholds. They need more stimulation. 25% uh, of the population have low thresholds. They are more sensitive to sensory stimulation. They need less stimulation. And 39% was in the middle, either or. We don't necessarily mind. Okay. And then just I want to show you some of our strategies just because simplicity is one of our core values. And I believe, I truly, truly believe with all my heart that sometimes we want to solve problems way too complicated. It should be more simple. Um, so the strategies that we do are all tangible. It's easy. It's simple. It's quite aha and it's quite profound. And if we work through them, people implement them and you will remember them. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through. And what it is all about, we talk about bottom up versus top down self-regulation. This is very, very important. We talk about bottom up versus top down down regulation. Now, top-down regulation is your typical talk therapies, your typical psychology route that you would work, not all of them, but we want to do is bottom-up self-regulation. So if you do a sensory action, we actually reach the areas that can lower your stress, that can lower um, um, your overload much, much faster, as opposed to going through talk therapy. It's quicker, it's faster, and it's more effective, okay? And it works, okay? So there's three ways that we do this. Sentry snacks, no, it's not what you eat. I'll explain to you now. Sentry diets, no, you also don't need to go on a diet. And sentry economics. Sentry snacks are quick, easy things that we can do that's going to help the brain stay focused. That's how we manage ourselves. It should not take you more than five minutes. Five minutes is already a lot. You've seen Marita was drinking her water bottle. I always have a glass of water next to me. I just prefer a glass uh, because I actually have, I prefer temperature. So I've got a flask with ice cold water and then I top it up as I go throughout my day. The temperature is important for me. If I drink cold water, it helps me to stay regulated. For Marita, she needs to suck it. If she sucks it through her sports water bottle, it self-regulates her better. Those are the quick things. Sentry diet is what type of lifestyle activity should you be doing that's going to maintain your, uh, your sentry needs. And then sentry economics, how should you change your environment? I'm going to talk you through it very, very quickly. These are the typical sentry snacks that we talk about. Breathing, blowing. Yes, you can nibble on certain food types, but please don't see food as self-regulation, but then it should be healthy. Nuts, for instance, is healthy, but too many, too, uh, many nuts is also not great. So anything crunchy or celery or apples, the crunchy type of food helps the brain to stay focused. Water bottle is the best one. Move your body and then just touch, you know, washing your hands. We need to wash our hands now anyway. Putting cream on it is a way that we can provide us a little bit of touch elements. These are all quick, fast. There's many, many more. These are just the what we call the top five that works for everyone. We talk about sentry diets. I'm just giving you a few. You know, knitting, certain people use knitting as a way to self-calm, to self-regulate. Are you a biker? Do you swim? Do you do photography? Whatever it is, we need to have these activities incorporated into our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, which is going to keep our systems intact. And then sentry economics, clutter, 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 clutters, madness for the brain. You know, all you need to change the lights, have you got a quiet corner that you can sit in or have you muted your notifications? Just some of the examples. So by making small, simple, easy, very tangible changes to your life, you can actually fit into your core fundamental baseline needs in order to help yourself stay focused. Okay. So this is a little bit, we do the matrix, we look at the environment, insight and understanding. This is our assessment loop. And the self-regulation loop is through sentry snacks, sentry diet, and sentry economics. Okay. I'm going to hand over to Marita. I know we have um, 10 minutes left only. If you guys wanted to maybe throw some questions in the chat box so long, Marita, can you just talk us through uh, the, uh, the, the course for people, just a bit of an overview on our course? I've spent more time to just 
bring you into the sentry intelligence world, but Marita can tell you just a little bit more about the course. Um, yeah, Marita, do you want to run for it? Yes, absolutely. So the details about the course for those of you, and I really hope a lot of you join us. It really is an amazing life altering course. Um, it runs for six weeks. So we have it every Tuesday and Thursday, two hour slots. Uh, we have two options, either the 9 to 11. That's so that we can accommodate the guys in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, on that side of the world as well. And then the three to five o'clock slots in the afternoon. Um, that's for our, our US-based people that wants to join the South Africans. And well, thank goodness for online, we can go right across the globe. Very important, whichever time slot you choose initially, that will be your time slot for the full six weeks because we do grow a community. There's a lot of breakout rooms and group work. So it just makes it, it fair and better to the rest of the group that you really do build um, a great community in your time slot. Um, all right, then all of the sessions are done via live Zoom, obviously live Zoom. Um, so what happens is once you've signed up, you will automatically, automatically be added to the calendar entry. So you'll have your Zoom link on your calendar, on your phone, on your computer. You will also get emails with your Zoom links. But that really makes it great because with Zoom, what we do is we record each session and you then have access to it, which I'm going to get to now when we look at our learning management system. Um, yeah, with our learning management system, Kajabi, as we call it, we sometimes just talk about Kajabi and forget that we've actually got to remind people that's our learning portal. That's where we put all the recordings of the session. So you will have access for 65 days. We usually give you access about 10 days before the course starts. The upcoming course in September will be on the 8th of September. So you will get access towards the end of August. And there you can see the previous course recordings. Um, there's a lot of things that we share on Kajabi. There's articles, there's research, there's images. And a very big part of that wonderful um, system that we use is the comment section. Because on the comment section, everybody that's on the course and everyone that's ever been on the online course can put their questions and you can answer. So it's, it's really a great, a great place it's an extra library that's how I see it there's a lot of questions that comes up and that's already come up during previous um, courses and then it's really great to go back and, and look at all the answers that people that fellow professionals actually gave from their point of view so yeah Kajabi we absolutely absolutely love Kajabi it really makes a big difference um, once you sign up you will get your sign in to Kajabi once you um sign up for the, for the course and, and purchase your ticket. And from that, we will send all communication. So it's really important that people get into Kajabi as quick, soon as possible. The other system that we use is Digify. Now, Digify is our secure platform, our secure data room, where we use all our, where we put all our course content. Like in the olden days when we had face-to-face, -face, olden days, well, it's not that long ago. But when we had workbooks, typical printed workbooks that you would get, you still have all of that content, but now we keep it in Digify. So there you also will have access 65 days, uh, the same time as you have on Kajabi. All your course content is on there. All the slides of the presentations of the Zoom sessions is also accessible um, to view or to be printed. So that's a really, really great system that we use. It's very secure. And then for ongoing support, yeah, we do use, we, we ask people to use the Kajabi comment section because that really opens it up to everybody so that everyone can see all the questions, especially between the AM and PM group as well. And it's just nice to keep it all together. But we are there for ongoing support. Alison, our wonderful support angel, um, is always there to help people, for instance, with Digify or Kajabi. If, if you have, if your system has a lot of firewalls, your server, she helps. She's the go-to girl. She can help with, with all of those kind of issues. So that's a, that's a really great um, support that we have to get you onto all the different systems. Then the next one, just quickly, the 12 modules. So the, the first few modules are always the heavy ones. It's the interesting ones, but it's the heavy ones because because everything that we do at Century Intelligence is based on science. We do have to go into the science, even though the solution is we, we make as simplistic as possible. We do need that background. So module one, introductions and orientation, just for you to get a feel of exactly 
what, what's going to happen in the next 11 modules. Um, and then module two, the theory and constructs of sensory processing, really digging in deeper. The neuroscience pathways and sensory connections, these are very interesting modules. Uh, the research and scientific data, that's Anna Marie's thing, she can, you can wake her up in the middle of the night and she can give you all the, all the research. Don't make me for that. I love it, but I have to go read up on it. Um, then we get into a bit of the more practical side where we look at sensory assessments for adults because we do recognize, as Anna Maria said, that there are quite a lot of different assessments. And there we will also boil it down to how, how the sensory matrix originated and why it originated. Then we go into your sensory matrix, which for me is an amazing part of this whole course, because it's not just about teaching you the theory um, and the practicalities for your clients, but we make it real for you first. You've got to understand it for your own sensory thresholds and for your own sensory style first, because then it's just so much easier to literally go and live it out to your clients. After the sensory matrix, module seven, we then do the sensory matrix for a client and you do part of your sign-up process, part of your um, sign-up fee is two passwords for your own sensory matrix and for a client or a family member. Um, next up is sensory audits in the environment, a very interesting module, very important because that would be your Mercedes and your Singapore Airlines and who wants to be a millionaire. There it really becomes real. And there you'll see that it's easy things that you can change. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to be big things. It can merely be changing your seating. You'll see, you'll find out. It's really interesting. Um, we do then look at sensory overload and stress because like in module 10 with mental health applications, that really is a big part of the sensory matrix. On the one hand, for someone that's already got mental health issues, but also for someone that's on the verge. Um, so we do look at overload and stress and what are the signs to look out for. Uh, mental health applications, intervention models, we go into detail and then we look at case studies because case studies, yeah, that's the proof is in the pudding and that, that's exactly what you find in the case studies. And then lastly, we go into implementation because now that you've got this wonderful tool and all of this information, what do you do with that next? So there we spend a whole module where you can bring all your questions and we really help you and guide you to see what the next steps could possibly be for you. And once you've completed the course, you are then a sensory intelligence practitioner, um, which means you are part of the sensory intelligence community, which we are very, very happy about. And we do keep contact with all of our practitioners and really are there to give support and to help along the way. So we hope to see you there. It really is an amazing course. Now for questions. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, I got, I got Marita part of our business after she's done our uh, the practitioner's course many, many years ago. And uh, well, so the proof is she is here. We don't have much time, guys, but are there any questions? You are welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions. I know we've thrown a lot of detail at you, uh, but I don't know if there's anyone with any questions. Uh, Tracy, oh, great. Glad that you were here. Thank you for being here. Any questions, guys? You can also pop. I missed the first part. What is the cost? I know I'm supposed to know. Uh, Marita, what is the cost? The cost for the September course is $990. But at this stage, the early bird is still, uh, you're still eligible for the early bird, which runs until end of June, end of this month. That's $900. We also have a payment plan. So if you sign up before the end of June, you can do three installments of 330 and then after June, we'll have a payment plan where there will be two installments. I can't do the math now. Sorry, it's the end of the day, but it will be 90 <laughs> divided by two. Also, also um, I mean, we are proudly South African, but guys, we do have a global audience. We actually run this course worldwide. Uh, we do have a Mandela discount. So if you're a local, um, so local is lacquer, uh, you can just pop us an email and then we can give you... Um, the Mandela discount as well. We are mindful of the fact that the exchange rent isn't always very really favorable for us in South Africa. So we do make a provision for that. Um, any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Okay. Um, it is four o'clock. So I just want to leave you with this. First, the education of the census, then the education of the intellect, which is a wonderful quote by Maria Montessori. And we really feel 
uh, absolutely passionate about sensory intelligence. It really is a phenomenal way to understand yourself, to understand the brain, to work with mental health relationship and productivity. Um, and it does come first. It does have preference and hierarchy and how the brain works. So uh, we really thank you for your time being here. Um, please do follow, make contact with us. Uh, it's on our website if you want to join our course. We would love to have you there. As Marita said, we really honor and support the practitioners and we do become part of a community going forward. And it is about us empowering you to expand your own toolbox and be the practitioner or the service provider of choice. So thank guys, it's four o'clock, 4.01. I'm one minute over. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for showing us your lovely faces and having your names on the call. We hope to hear from you again. Take care and be safe. Cheers. Bye-bye, everyone.